In this lecture on the way of things, we're going to talk a little bit about the wind and how we can understand it and try to understand it from an ancient perspective, from a hunter-gatherer perspective, uh, rather than the modern perspective. Uh, the biggest difference being that today in our culture, in the modern world, we understand that the wind is a global event, that we have satellites and uh, weather maps that show high and low pressure zones and things like that. And, and we can uh, sometimes uh, gauge and predict a storm sometimes half a world away that, hey, this disturbance out here is, might be a hurricane and watch it cross the entire Atlantic Ocean and, and just keep track of it uh, day by day when it's still thousands of miles away from us. And, and we tend to have that kind of view of it and an understanding of the jet stream and, and all this kind of uh, modern view of the wind. Um, but all of us, regardless of where we're from, of course, came from a hunter-gatherer stock, whether we're from Asia or Africa or Europe or uh, even the Americas. And hunter-gatherers didn't have that kind of view of the world. They didn't have satellite pictures. They didn't have that kind of uh, understanding. Um, but that's not to say uh, they were ignorant. And in fact, We've lost a lot of this understanding, this more local understanding of these global events like the wind. Um, so we're going to try to understand the wind in this lecture on a more personal level, an individual level, um, and a level and a way that we can go out into the desert and see the ways in which the wind is interacting with the environment and from that then we will be able to react more correctly or have a, a correct knowledge and natural knowledge uh, of the wind in all that it is. Um, so let's begin. Now the way we're going to try to look at the wind uh, today, and there's different ways, of course, we could talk about how it works with scent and so forth, um, which is definitely in that hunter-gatherer mindset. But we want to look today at the wind and how it works with mountains. Um, all these mountains, you, you can't find a mountain that doesn't interact with the wind. Uh, the problem is, for us modern people, is that oftentimes this reaction is so confusing because the mountain is a complex uh, structure and its complexity means it has a complex aerodynamics. And while that terminology might be seen odd to be talking about when you're talking about the hunter-gatherer perspective, Indeed, these people understood that. They understood their own idea, their own concept of aerodynamics, whether it was building an aero shaft, which definitely has aerodynamics involved, or how and where to walk or look for game on a mountain range relative to how the wind works it. They definitely understood these kind of things. And to start with, like anything else, we need to start with a simple example and then build ourselves into a more and more complex uh, model. So we'll start with, here's our ground level, and we'll just have a kind of a lump of a mountain. Not really much, much there. And we'll have our wind come in this direction. Now for this uh, lecture, we're going to be mostly talking about the prevailing wind, or the direction that the wind comes from the most. 
and often the strongest. Now, the first thing we know when the wind starts hitting this mountain from this direction, coming this way, is it's blown along all these little particles along the ground. Now those particles could be leaves, dead insects, sand, dust, pollen, all kinds of stuff that's, that's in that stuff moving along the ground. And when it hits the mountain, it's going to tend to stop and it's going to bury this mountain something like this. So we have, and the reason is, is this wind's going to come over and up and it's hitting and you get a turbulence you get pressure and it gets driven in there. And then at this point here, we'll mark it like this. That's going to be a position where the wind is moving up the mountain and it's at an increased velocity. Uh, and anything that's up in here is going to impact the mountain, but probably continue going. But it's going to impact with an increased velocity. Uh, and so it's going to have a, a scouring effect. Um, and then when it gets down on the leeward side, the downwind side, this is acting somewhat like an airfoil, or in fact like an airfoil. The wind's going to come along like this, and there's going to be a low pressure and an eddy system in here, where the winds might be circulating. But as they do, they're going to lay down a lot of debris. And typically, and I say typically, that debris is going to start fairly high on the mountain and it's going to try to pull a shallower slope. That's, that's going to be a typical wind shaped mountain or wind that the influence of it being shaped uh, by the wind. Now what's going to happen of course as the ages roll by this stony mass that's going to be exposed to the wind, rain, water, um, you're going to get water in there and freeze break the stone and it's going to be a rocky, jumbly, uh, relatively sterile, um, I shouldn't say relatively sterile, but there's different times of the years that will actually have some advantages, but, but it's not going to have the plant life uh, as in abundance usually as elsewhere. Uh, whereas this side, the main strata of the mountain, the, the, the rocky mass, is actually protected some. It's actually got a covering of sand and these plants that you might have a bush grown here in a root system that doesn't really get into the rocky mass of the mountain. Whereas if you do get a plant to start here, it's usually rooted straight in to the rock. It's breaking rock just to survive. Um, and so you have, in a sense, a bow wave, which is this, and a wake, which is this. As this mountain, in essence, you know, is moving through the wind. Of course, in reality, the wind is moving across the mountain. But that's a basic understanding of how wind and mountains react. Uh, from that, you can start building more and more complex models depending on the shape. You can have a scooped mountain where it's a V and, and funneling air up, up through and over, and you can have all kinds of other shapes, but that's the basic shape that these mountains are going to have. And it's one of the things that is sometimes easy to pick out. Of course, snow can, can, can affect like this. Sand will affect like this. And if you don't have a lot of sand or dust or dirt in an area, it'll often look like this effect is not there. But with closer examination, you'll find however thin it might be, this effect is in fact there. And with that, I thank you for listening and hope you find the way of things in the desert. Thank you.
Well, I welcome you here. Um, today we have another lecture. Um, this one will be on the wind. And of course it's going to be from the personal or individual uh, point of view, the hunter-gatherer point of view, if you will. And in our last lecture we talked about the prevailing wind. Uh, but of course that's not the only kind of wind uh, that we have and it's not the only effect. Uh, one of the ways we can use the wind and gauge it uh, that our ancestors used oftentimes, and it made a tremendous difference in the environment, was that the wind, a wind event, say an overnight wind, uh, would often clear the tracks of the days before, sometimes weeks and months would go by, with very little wind, and then a wind event would come along and essentially brush out or blow out all the old tracks. And this would make it very easy for finding new tracks. And when you found a, a track like that, you knew it was fresh. Uh, so that's another way in which the wind, uh, a single day's wind, could change things. Uh, and we do need to take this into account. But there's other times when you can actually sometimes see uh, the event, a wind event, weeks or months after it's, it's happened. Uh, it depends on its intensity and the situation at the time. And, you know, your uh, observations sometimes on these events uh, they're clues. They're not necessarily uh, something you can say this in fact happened, but you start looking at clues and, and, and get the idea how did this happen or how did this occur and sometimes you are able to realize that there was a wind event of some kind weeks or even months ago or, or days, days past. So let's take a look at how one might discern, other than using tracks, uh, a wind event uh, that was significant or could be significant to somebody walking the desert. So let's take a look. So we have a mountain here. Again, now for this uh, model, we're looking down onto the mountain and Let's say it's a uh, mountain maybe shaped like something like this. Now, the normal direction, let's say the wind, the, the prevailing wind is this way. It's this mountain this way. And it's got all the signs you can read. The, the sand low down on here, the, so to speak, a double bow wave, and you're getting wind rushing up through here, and you're getting a trail sand dune along here. All the, all the normal stuff that you can see from a prevailing wind. But let's say it's the middle of winter, and we've gotten some rain, and then we get a wind coming down out of the north. Now, again, we in the modern world know we could say something, well, that's an Arctic air mass coming down. Uh, we might even know that it's coming. We don't have to actually go out on the land uh, a week later and say, wow, that looks like there was an Arctic air mass flowing through here. We knew about it before it even got there. But uh, the ancient people in the natural way, if you will, of kind of looking at some of this stuff. They didn't have that, but they could still sometimes look at it in a, their own way. So let's say this bitter northern air is coming this way, and it's blowing across this mountain. Well, the first thing you can see is it's going to blow some of the wind, and it's going to affect, it's going to scour on some of these dunes. That, and they may not even be dunes. It, you'll find debris shoved up into bushes and stuff that uh, are into rocks and crevices that normally aren't there. And 
if we'd had a rain before that, you might see that on this side, if this is a, we'll put this as a ridge line, on this side of this mountain, there might have been some sprouting, and we've got another little ridge line here, and there's plants sprouting all up and down here because we'd had a rain. Well, this bitter northern dry winds come along and just wilted, either dried out or froze everything on that side of the mountain. But this slope is essentially facing the same way. However, it's actually protected by this slope in front of it. So the winds, the bitter winds kind of curl over. There's eddies and it's a broken up air system. It doesn't have a lot of velocity. And so this area here that has all these plants, because it doesn't have that bitter dry wind scouring and forcing it right into, the, into every nook and cranny, it actually stays moist. It actually stays the temperature of the ground holds better because this air is being kind of forced to curl with low velocity over the top. So you could actually walk along here and see that the wind has changed the debris, the direction of the debris here and here would be more obvious. But then you'd find that the plants dead and wilted along here and you would also find here that they were sheltered even though it's a slope facing the same direction. So when you start to be able to pick up and pull up some of this stuff, all you have to really do to do it is to walk and, and be observant and be aware that these things become important because you'll find if you're some small rodent and you have to make a living over here, you're in a bad way where the rodent on the same kind of strata, same kind of dirt, same kind of slope, and yet he's doing better because that one single day or day and a half of a howling north wind did bring death and destruction, brought it here, but this was protected. And this is a way that you can start to read the wind on a mountain range. And when you do, like so many other things, it will begin to change where and how you walk and what and how you see things. And you'll be more in concert, you might say, with the way of things. And with that, I thank you.